Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. This show is the state of the state of Hawaii. And I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. This show brings you newsworthy topics and issues affecting Hawaii. And it does so through conversation with guests whose expertise and viewpoints can inform us. Uh, even beyond other media resources. Um, today's show guest has deep experience in public service for Hawaii and um, at highest levels, uh, including the US Congress. So I, I, as we all read and hear, Hawaii's economy is emerging from the depths of the pandemic. And of course we all want to know how it's going and, how, it, how it's managed and how our leaders are serving us and how we're gonna see us get back and get better. But today's show guest, Colleen Hanabusa, has deep experience in public service for Hawaii and, and she can give us glimpses and backstage looks at how the benefits of what has occurred recently that you may have heard about, which is the $1.9 trillion package known as the American Rescue Plan Act has brought enormous amounts of resources funding, federal funding into the country and into each state. And uh, so we're interested in this act, we can call it the ARP um, for short, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 is ARP for short. And we would really like to know how it is that the leaders and the policymakers who are going to be making decisions about the disposition and the allocations of this, these funds and how that's going to ensure uh, benefits to Hawaii and, and to all of its citizens. Welcome, Colleen Hanabusa. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. And uh, mahalo for joining us today and to, for sharing uh, your your uh, insights and uh, thoughts of um, of how how this is all going to work as as you're not one one of the people actually doing it right now, but you may be as you move into your new position, you'll probably have to do with some of the transportation side of the funding that's coming from the feds. But why don't we start by having you just give us a little update or a little uh, pricey of what you have done uh, in your service for Hawaii at the national and state level and uh, how that public service has been your life and continues to be and will again be public service for you with the uh, heart. Well, thank you, Stephanie. And I, I gotta tell you, um, I didn't begin as, uh, if you look at many of my colleagues who still serve in State legislature. Many of them uh, went from uh, undergraduate to uh, law school or graduate school, and from there into uh, service uh, by by getting an elected position. I was exactly sort of the opposite. I, I I'm a lawyer by training, and you know I I was in my 40s before I actually ran for office. And the reason why is I'm fourth generation of from the Waianae Coast. And, you know, it's always been a, uh, an issue for me as to why it seems like everyone forgets that there's a YNI after Kahe power plant, as I say. And, and as a result of that, I decided at one time that, you know what, I'll throw my name in for an election. And, and you know, the worst that can happen is that I'd be in the same place. I'd be back practicing law and nothing else would change. But maybe I could make a difference. And that was in 1998 when I ran and I took office in 1999. And as uh, some may know, I served in the Hawaii State Senate for 12 years. The last four, I was president of the Senate, the first woman to lead either chamber and the first Asian woman in the United States to lead a legislative house like that. But the uh, other interesting thing is for, with the exception of two years, I think for the whole 10 years, I held various leadership positions within the Hawaii State Senate. And in 2010, I ran for the U.S. Congress. Uh, that was a very interesting election, to say the least. And 
in the end, in the general election, um, won that position and has served a total of little over six years in the Congress of the United States. And in between, I've, I've run for various positions unsuccessfully. But, you know, with each one of those um, adventures, for lack of a better description, it's, uh, it's made me even appreciate more what, what we have as a country, but how special Hawaii is. So I'm always gravitating back home and running for office here. But what um, my stint in Congress has shown me is um, it's no different whether you're in the Congress of the United States or you're in the legislature here. It's all based on relationships. And uh, many of the relationships that I developed in Washington, they're, they're going, they're still there. Many of them are still there. Some have moved on. We've got a governor among our ranks. And, uh, and but it's, it really is important to always stay focused on what is important. And it's important for us in Hawaii because we're so far away and people tend to forget about us. And some people just think we're an exotic place to, to go vacation. And so they don't think about us as having the same kinds of, of problems or the, the, the challenges that everyone else. Well, we're in paradise. That's how right. they think about it, so we don't have challenges. That's right. No, it, it is true. I mean, even when you like you like for example nationally you hear the uh, the hate crimes that are occurring uh, and you know uh, of course Black Lives Matter and and then you have the, the focus on the Asians and then recently on the people of um, who would be considered or consider themselves Jewish you know and then that and that's uh, something that. I didn't think we'd see, especially in big cities like New York and Los Angeles. I didn't think you'd find that because that's not the way you expect people in urban cities, especially big cities, to, to act. But instead, we're finding that. And it makes you wonder, what's going, what's going on? What, what's happening to our country? We do need to talk more about that. And I, I mean, it's a very pleased and proud of um Maisie Hirono, our senator, did have that role with, with that Asian um, mm -hmm. act. That, that was very, very good work. And we need to hear a lot more uh, from her about that. And Hawaii needs to be seen as more of a resource for how to get as far as, as we have here and how we're going forward with Aloha for everyone and how that works. But that, that's another topic for another time. So mm. we that to do. Um, yeah, I just think that your 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 service at the state level, and then um, and then also at the federal level with the Congress, um, that that just gives you such a broad view and such a, a big oversight of how all of these things work. Am I am I exaggerating what happened? No, you what what you are saying is and and uh, thank you for saying that. But what Congress uh, did for me personally is that uh, not only do you have the opportunity to develop the relationships, but it also makes you understand the process that, that the country goes through. Because, you know, there is, like I tell people, there is no greater legislature in the world than the Congress of the United States. And to, to watch how issues get developed, and even with the lack of bipartisanism, I think that's the best way to put it. When, even with both sides of the aisles, you know, sort of digging in and not coming together, it still manages to address certain things. Like, for example, uh, you started with uh, talking about the American Rescue Plan. But remember, there were various versions of how, to re how, how we would come out of COVID or how we would help people health-wise or, or the business-wise, all before ARP. And I'm talking about what we call CARES Act. Uh, which was in March uh, a year ago, 20, 20, 2020. And then in December, uh, remember, I call it CARES Act too because C-R-R-S-A is, is a mouthful, but that was in December. And both CARES Act 1, as I call it, and CARES Act 2 were under the Trump administration. So you know that you have that. And of course, yes, you know, we have the majority of the uh, the two, the two, um, 
branches of government, but but it was it was still a situation where what well, one majority, uh, and then but it was still a, a, a to show you how even in that situation people could come together and people oh, could begin to look at things. That's a wonderful point to make. That really is given given our our. Uh, dividedness now i i think um it's so good you brought up the history of those other other federal funding packages because hawaii already has received a big chunk uh to you know mm -hmm. solve some of its tremendous um challenges which were going to be very hard on people in terms of layoffs and furloughs and and just not being able to to meet those payrolls given our dependence on the way mm -hmm. our and the way our economy works. I mean, the state can get so close to the bone so fast, which is a little bit disturbing. I mean, there are other states like us. I mean, Alaska kind of is too, because they desert, they they take tourists too and depend on that trade. But to get so close to the bone so fast, and then for you to say how wonderful it is to be at that federal level with those resources and that capacity to 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 come to policy making and decisions that are beneficial to the country. But to be able to draw on the, the resources of that, to be able to put together a $1.9 trillion bill that is going to take all this money out and distribute it through the country is just enormously, incredibly wonderful. And, uh, and that's one of our, our the, so part of the greatness of the country is that, we're, that it has been productive enough to have that kind of capacity, financial capacity. Um, so I, I, I would imagine, um, that that was pretty awesome too, to, to see it all work like that and to, to feel like there's not the bottom. I mean, like here in Hawaii to get so close to the bottom with people not having enough to eat is, is very disturbing, but to know that we're in the bigger picture with help, like this, uh, this ARP or ARP mm -hmm. act, maybe it is called the ARP. I, I haven't heard right. it said as many uh, times as I, I should have, but it's, um, well, I wanted to bring down that one, um, that 1 1.9 trillion, which is of course going to many categories of mm -hmm. need throughout the country to, to and the purpose um, is of course to combat, combat uh, COVID-19 itself. And then to also um, ameliorate the impact of the virus and the, and the pandemic on Public health and uh, and the um, and the country's economy and and all the state's economy. So all of the categories of the states have been um, uh, given uh, portions of this 1.9 trillion package. But just for example, to bring it down to earth, <laughs> still pretty high. I mean, the, like the education mm -hmm. was given. Um, uh, for the country, one hundred and twenty-two billion, and that's still just a huge, huge amount with for our fifty states and territories. But, but for the state of Hawaii, um, the education portion was roughly about five hundred and fifty-two million, so almost half a billion dollars. To well, you know, uh, Stephanie, the other thing uh, that you have to uh, focus on is the fact that when we had CARES Act 1, it was like 2.2 trillion. And CARES Act 2, if I remember correctly, was just under, uh, it was about 900 billion, so just under a trillion. And, and in each of those bills, there were uh, education components. But only in CARES Act 1 and in this AR, ARP uh, that um, was passed in March of this year, do yeah. you have any grants directly to the state and counties? And so the first one, I, I believe Hawaii received in March of last year, one point, about well, one point two five uh, billion dollars, of which though uh, three hundred and eighty some odd went directly to the city and county of Honolulu. Of that, so it was about eight hundred some odd million that went to Hawaii. In the second bill, in CARES Act two, there were no direct grants, and that was a major point of contention between the Democrats and the Republicans, in, uh, and basically President Trump, who said he's not going to give any more monies directly to the state. The, a, the This recent ARP with President Biden, Hawaii got about 1.6, Hawaii directly, 
got about one point six uh, billion dollars, and that's and and when you add everything together with the states, the other counties, I think it adds up to about two point two. Honolulu, I guess, getting the other lion's share, of almost four hundred a million dollars. Having the reason I bring that up is because what I think a lot of people don't realize is education is a separate category. So it's not in that. Education had its own. So education, for example, in with what we call CARES Act one was about 45 million. CARES Act two, it went up to about 120 some on million. This is just elementary education, by the way. And in, in ARP, elementary education, which is called ESSER, the ESSER funding went up to about 412 million. This is, does not come out of the state portion. This is just in education. And when you were um, talking to me earlier about it, you said, how is it that, you know, Hawaii um, is able to survive with, with education? And the reason is definitely because, interestingly, in CARES Act 1 and CARES Act 2, and ARP has a different version of it, there were specific provisions written in it about education. One was called continued payment. In other words, when you receive the funds, it required not only the, um, edu- well, actually for us, it's the Department of Education, but remember, we are unique because we're the only state-run education system in the whole United States. So they had to do a, a certificate, uh, basically to sign to the Department of Education nationally and said, okay, we agree to these terms and the terms that they want. And by the way, the governor also had to agree because governor was given discretionary funds in education as well. And also the university system. But we're just talking about elementary ed now, just because those numbers are fresh in my mind. The um, They have to agree uh, in the one and two version to what they call continued payment. In other words, you have to you have to agree that you would make every effort an extraordinary effort. Uh, to make sure that you don't cut anybody's pay. And in addition to that, uh, they had what is called a maintenance of effort, which said that the state, in order to get these funds, had to agree that they would continue to fund the Department of Education. The state would continue to fund the Department of Education at basically the same level, which is one, and two, in a proportionate level. And by the way, that's also found in ARP. Yes. It, yeah, and ARP has an additional condition, which is very relevant for Hawaii, and that's called maintenance of equity, which is to ensure that, for example, Native Hawaiian education uh, continues to benefit. And, of course, on the mainland, uh, we're talking about the Native Americans and the Alaska Natives. So when you look at all of that, education had a, a different life cycle, so to speak. And that's why yeah, we was able, you were able to see uh, what education managed to do for everyone else. As I, I don't know if you recall, initially, the governor said he was going to institute furloughs and cutbacks and uh, yeah. layoffs. Remember that? Yeah. I mean, that was getting down to the bone and trying to put to right. price. Right. And then when, when this came in and, and with education, and then he said there will be no furloughs and layoffs. And, so as a result of the this, this funding source that came in, I attribute that to the reason why uh, all of the public sector employees did not get the technically the layoffs or anything due to this because of the fact that not only did education have this huge amount of money that came in directly for education, but in addition to that, the governor had his funds and he could use that for the other employees not specifically covered by the, um, by ESSER, uh, Education Act. Well, I think that with that, what is it that the education has like a 2.1 billion budget each year, but it's mostly coming from funds that weren't lucrative during the pandemic. I mean, clearly an example of the impact of COVID so that that, that was going to be a dire strait situation without, without this, this influx of money. But um, I think that um, 
there were, like you say, there are these conditions on the money. And so the, and, and then there's lots of them for those ESSER funds. I mean, like right. you have to go directly to public schools and, and, and 90% of that money has to actually be put into the field and um, reported that way. So I think, you know, there are certainly considerable, uh, I, I don't know, these are not necessarily, are these regs already or they're just coming right out of the statute? I don't know, but I think that, um, there are lots of uh, of interesting conditions. Now, do you think that the department and um, is, I'm sure they're ready to do this, but what do you think about how this process is gonna move? So you talked about that earlier in understanding, you know, more about how these decisions are made and how they work. So how do you see that this department so dependent now on, on this these funds and, um, and the state not having the, um, you know, the resources to handle that. But but do you see them being able to manage all this? Because isn't this like a new assignment? Do they have the staff? Do they understand how it works? How long is it going to take? And uh, will the public be able to, is the public going to be informed and will they see? So can you comment on how you see that might go? You know, uh, what's interesting is that, for example, because it's government, Funding and it's government. It's a government entity, and it's a and it's a law. Uh, technically, the agencies are to implement rules, which helps you understand. Or and it's you know you you know what it's the Federal Registry and it's, it's the uh, CFRs, and then they're supposed to do that to to sort of give you guidance. Uh, what happened in CARES Act One is that um, the state of Washington, and I just know this because I served with Governor Inslee. Uh, he sued then the Betsy DeVos, Secretary DeVos, yes. because she interpreted the first CARES Act one, I think, of giving almost 50% of the funds to private schools. And he sued, saying, you can't do that. We need all the money. And then they stopped. And she did it by a, a rule. And he, he sued and he said, you can't do that because we have a rule. That's Presently, interesting. I have yeah. That certainly would be an issue it could be an issue here in Hawaii that's oh certain. definitely because we have such a high percentage of students who are actually in private schools so you can imagine uh I, I'm I'm I was it was curious because I was beginning to watch the private schools and wondering if if one they they understood that this was best Betsy DeVos's interpretation or two you know whether they would uh, say anything from that but it was it was really a fascinating thing because now there is an interim rule, interim final rule implemented in April uh, for how you would do ARP under education. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what's causing some of the issues now because I think the Department of Education here is saying we got to do surveys, we got to do all of that. But if you really, if you read it, what they're saying, what the feds are saying is, okay, we're giving you two thirds of the money. But for the final third, you have to show us how you're complying with all these different conditions. So it's it's in the rule and whether or not or how the DOE actually implements it, we have to wait and see. But it to me, the way it's written is two thirds of the money is, is out there. And and I don't believe as of this date that uh, the Department of Education has expended even CARES Act two monies and definitely not ARP monies. And I think they still have some leftovers from CARES Act one. So that's why there's a huge chunk of money out there. Yeah. Which is a, a, a very, uh, a, you know, very positive situation to be mm -hmm. in, especially. Mm -hmm. But like what you're saying in one of the uh, publications in the Department of Education, um, you know, with the, with the LEAs or the local ed agency, right. schools returning to, in-person instruction, this, the public schools, there has to be a plan at, and um, and it must be within 30 days of receiving the funds. Right. All these rules have these specifics in them, but they have to get public comment before. Well, that's the new, that's the, the, the latest rule implementation. But Stephanie, remember Hawaii is unique. We don't really have LEA. We only have a SCA, a state education agency. Because right. we are the, yeah, so it's, it, and so I know for the Department of Education, it's always been a matter of going to the DOE and saying, hey, this doesn't apply to us. We're not, 
We don't function like the rest of the United States. So we should have an easier time because it's on one level and it's everything is uniform. In other words, it's a policy that's implemented throughout the state. So I would like to think that that's something that makes it easier and we're able to do it. And I think the department, if I if my information is correct, has sent out surveys and done that. And the, but the question is going to be, uh, if you read it, you know, the department said we're giving you two thirds of the funds, but for this final third, you have to show us, and and we'll see. But it, I think it's not as um, as grave a situation as some may make it out. Well, I mean, I think that it is stepping up to a challenge that they may not be even staffed for. Uh, this this given circumstances and the money decreasing, you know, we've been in this crisis for a year. So I, I think that this is a challenge, which is, and yes, and I, I agree, it all falls what you're saying, because we are just an SEA. Um, um, it all falls on the department. And uh, so I, 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 I wonder, um, do you see that there's going to be any um, remedy here to, to help them through it? Or what, what do you think? Are they? Gonna oh, yeah. Uh, Stephanie, yeah. I think it's because, like I said earlier, you haven't expended all of CARES Act 1 and you haven't expended CARES Act 2. I think that's a that's a huge hunk of money yet that they can expend for specific purposes. And arguably, you could say, you know, two thirds of the other money. So. I think they would be able to do that. It's just a matter of um, deciding. I think this is more of a jurisdictional issue between does the legislature decide how you expend these funds? This was my next question. There's no oh, superintendent. Or, yeah. That is, the, is that going to move then? So is the department going to be working more hand in the glove with the legislature? And it's, it's, it gets even more complicated than that, because under our Constitution, the policymakers for education is the Board of Education, which isn't the Department of Education. So you have all these different layers of who to deal with. And, the, and you know, the legislature is always going to say we're the we're the ultimate policymakers. And I, we were talking offline earlier. That's where if you look at Bill 613 which the governor may decide to veto or whatever, you know, that bill is set on, is set, is set out so that it says from CARES Act 1, basically, these are what's going to be funded from CARES Act 2, this is what's going to be funded, and from ARP, this is what's going to be funded. So arguably, the this plan or the survey doesn't apply to anything else other than the last third of the fund. So of ARP, so, you know, there's... We, I, I would assume the legislature would say we have the rights to determine everything else. And that's going to be the issue. That's there you go. Well, we are out of time and I'm amazing. <laughs> sorry, because we're just getting down to the, the meat of it. So we might have to talk more again as things develop and we are uh, apprised of uh, how the, this is going to be managed. Cause that's really the basic question here for this show is uh, does, does that, um, 613 bill solve the problems or <laughs> so anyway you've been most generous to come and share uh, uh how how it works and give us uh that a little handle on what what the challenge is for the people that are making these decisions so um thank you very much colleen and uh i'll look forward to having more talk with you about it in the future but this is the Think Tech Hawaii uh, show that is the state of the state of Hawaii. And uh, we have been speaking with Colleen Hanabusa, who is a former comic congresswoman and uh, will continue with her public service work here in Hawaii shortly in another role. So thank you very much. I'll see you again in two weeks on the next state of the state of Hawaii. Mahalo for your attention and uh, big aloha.